Again, this is very important to be detected very early, to be treated by uh, uh, by the that diagnosed first and then treated, and then there's a lot of cases uh, I found it by the most of people. And what is new? That uh, what is new? That is the effect of PRP uh, in cases of uh, front uh, female pattern hair loss, and uh, after six months, I found it a very good. Uh, uh, by uh, polioscope, polioscope, I bought uh, poly by polioscope because of Jerry, and uh, I have, I need a new one, Jerry, uh, if you can ask for it. Uh, and uh, this is what is meant by frontal fibrosis. Number one, I found it in May. Nowadays, I found it in May. And the number two, the what, what, uh, frontal fibrosis alopecia, I have now 62 cases. 62 cases of frontal fibrosis alopecia. I think it is an epidemic now. Uh, uh, I think it is epidemics in Egypt. I think. And there are many cases, this is new, which are thing I want to tell you here coming to me from Sudani Arabia. And I, I will show you three cases from Jeddah. From Jeddah and from Riyadh. And uh, there are many cases of frontal fibrosis alopecia. Min awul fatin hamama kalha. Min talat sinin kida. Surat fatin hamama kat amtaha frontal fibrosis alopecia. But could we or can we classify frontal fibrosing alopecia into sometimes with the pigmentation or pigmentosa like in planets, pigmentosa and the other with more prominent, more, more prominent facial papules with no pigmentation and this is the typical facial papule. But then I found many cases of the facial papule without frontal fibrosing alopecia. Is it a specific for the specific for frontal fibrosing alopecia, or could it be present in other diseases? <laughs> and this is the case of frontal fibrosing alopecia, and the many cases of frontal fibrosing alopecia, and the I mean to hear from him a very good discussion. When we are going to stop the treatment, this is by triposcopy, uh, we can find it, which is active, and this is before and after treatment, and then I will come to you again, and may I introduce to you Jerry again. Uh, and <laughs> Uh, these are the companies that I've worked for. These are my disclosures. Uh, so you have some idea that I'm a consultant, investigator, speaker for these companies. Now, my practice is very unique in that it is restricted only to disorders of the scalp and hair. I'm the only physician in the United States who just deals with scalp and hair problems. I don't see anything else. I spend one hour per patient. So every patient gets an hour of my time and more. I will never end the consultation. Um, the patient ends the consultation, not I. So my practice is unique. It's, people call it a boutique practice. 
and you know, it's, it's, it's very unique in that I spend so much time with them. And 30% of my patients have cicatricial alopecia. So how do I treat someone who has uh, these nodules and cysts, someone who has polytrichia, lots of hairs coming out of one ostia? A lot of what I'm about to discuss, we published already. This was in uh, Dermalogic Therapy. This was the first CME article in the Blue Journal and JAD. Uh, we published this in 2005. But then more recently, in December 2016, we published another uh, total review article, CME, on um, cicatricial alopecia. So a, a lot of what I'm going to say are, is, in that, in the, is in that article. And we looked at different, different uh, types of cicatricial alopecia, and we talked about the treatments in that. So I would suggest you might want to uh, refer to JAD 2016, the first, the uh, first two articles. So what's the definition of scarring alopecia? It is a group of disorders characterized by a final common pathway of replacement of follicular structure by fibrous tissue. Clinically, we see lack of follicular osteo. You don't see the holes. Histopathologically, there's obliteration of the hair follicle. And so the primary cicatricial alopecias involve preferential destruction of follicular epithelium with sparing of interfollicular dermis. And here are examples of, of primary cicatricial alopecias. We divide them into lymphocytic, neutrophilic, mixed, and then there's some that are non-specific. And we gear therapy according to the infiltrate to some extent. We usually like to take a biopsy to figure out what this is. We usually take a four millimeter punch biopsy from the edge of the lesion where it's active. And you can use your trichoscopy to determine where it's active. And that's where you would take the biopsy. So let's go through some of the more common ones like lupus, like thanapolaris, folliculitis de calvans, and dissecting cellulitis. A lot of what I'm about to discuss also has been described in detail in another Blue Journal article from uh, September 2014. The lead uh, author was Tamer Mupke from Saudi Arabia, and uh, he was my fellow then. And uh, a lot of what we talk about in the trichoscopy and everything by Lydia Rudnitschka is all in this article as well. So you may want to refer to that article, too. Now, there are no placebo-controlled, double-blind, and randomized studies on therapeutics for scarring alopecia. No evidence-based medicine. So what do I do? There's no evidence-based medicine. How do I treat it? I've been in practice now 30 years. So I have a feel for what works and what doesn't work. So let's talk about lupus first. Now, in terms of lupus presents usually with very red, scaly, atrophic areas, sometimes misdiagnosed psoriasis at the beginning, and then it can also affect the ear as well. And here you can see marked atrophic areas, and hyperpigmented areas can occur as well, and follicular hyperkeratosis. I use a lot of uh, photo finder, quantification and quality assessment to determine how aggressive I'm going to be with the condition. With PhotoFinder, you have excellent trichoscopy, and so you can really see what's going on and determine um, how much inflammation there is. So we'll uh, take uh, an area, a target area, look at it, and look at it very closely with the PhotoFinder. And uh, I won't go through the trichoscopy because other speakers will talk about it. So, but some basic uh, for discoid lupus is the large yellow dots or keratotic plugs. And there's a milky red strawberry ice cream color if it has been described. So what I'd really like to do is go over this uh, algorithm on how I treat it. So when somebody has discoid LA, if you look at the extent of disease, they have less than 10%, we'll use ultra-potent topical steroid, plus or minus uh, intralesional tramcillone acetonide every month. And what I use is um, it's 10 milligrams per cc 
I'll use two cc's and I'll give 20 injections of 0.1 cc each. If there is improvement, uh, great, we'll continue treatment as necessary. If there's no improvement, consider hydroxychloroquine, isotretinoin, and something called TCM. TCM is tacrolimus 0.3%, not 0.03 or 0.1, instead of Bill cleanser, which is my vehicle. And I use that twice a day. I'll also use it with corticosteroid, that's the C, and usually clobetazole solution BID, and I'll use 5% minoxidil solution to thicken up the hairs. If there's more than 10% scalp involvement, we'll go to hydroxychloroquine, 200 milligrams BID. Um, we'll also use ultrapotent topical steroids. We'll do the injections monthly, and I'll bridge it with prednisone, 40 milligrams a day, tapered over eight weeks. If there's improvement, we taper to the lowest effective dose. If there's no improvement, consider isotretinoin, and always consider your TCM as topical treatment. So that's the algorithm for um, lupus. Now, this was a patient that we published. Um, he had Bobsy proven lupus, and then, but we got him very early. So we put him on prednisone, injections, uh, and all the uh, topicals that were necessary, and we were able to save his hair. It is a trichologic emergency. You have to go get this really early, or they will lose their hair uh, very quickly. Now, how do I treat lichen planopilaris, which is more common? Um, we'll talk first about classic lichen planopilaris. The trichoscopy, again, will be discussed by other speakers. Uh, will be discussed by other speakers, but there's tubular hyperkeratosis, there are white dots, also in lichen planopilaris. Uh, just as you can have ulcerative lesions in the mouth from lichen planus, you can also have them on the scalp, so consider when you see an ulcerative lesion, it could be lichen planus as well. Pseudopilotic brock, I consider a form of lichen planus, um, for lichen planopilaris, when I read the original articles from the 1800s from the Pasteur Institute, which were in French, and I do speak French because I'm from Montreal, there were, it, it, he describes lichen planopilaris. The vertex is often involved. There are three patterns. There's confetti-like lesions, large plaques, or a combination of the two. This was in a 10-year-old boy who had uh, this kind of lichen plan, uh, planopilaris or pseudopilotic bra. It can be in plaque form. It, this is very common to see it like this. Histopathologically, you get an interface dermatitis that is, um, uh, that is just like like planus. And dermoscopy is always used. Look for erythema and hyperkeratosis. And this is very important to, in order for you to guide therapy. So how do I treat lichen planopilaris? Well, again, I look at the extent of the disease. If there's less than 10%, I'll use my TCM and the uh, corticosteroid intralesionally monthly. If there's improvement, we'll continue PRM. Okay, if there's no improvement, we go to this side here. Okay, and then doxycycline, 100 milligrams BID, or hydroxychloroquine, 200 milligrams BID, or both. I'll use TCM as well. I'll also use intralesional corticosteroids, and again, I may have a prednisone bridge. If there's improvement, it will taper to the lowest effective dose. If there's no improvement, consider mycophenyl and mofetil at 500 milligrams BID for the first month, then to one gram BID afterwards. Consider methotrexate at 50 milligrams per week, low dose of isotretinoin, and now I'm using JAK inhibitors. I find that they help in scarring hair loss and lichen planopilaris. Unfortunately, they're very expensive. It's hard to get a hold of them uh, uh, you know, at a reasonable price. Um, and we'll talk about how we can get it when I talk about alopecia reata, where the cheapest places in the world are to get it. But it's, it is a very, um, it does work in certain patients who have lichen planopilaris. So this is my, um, my algorithm. And also, we don't like to do hair transplants on these individuals if they have active disease because you can make them worse. Okay, so TCM, I just want you to remember that. So it's tacrolimus, 0.3%, 0.1%, 0.1%, 0.1%, 0.1%, 0.1%, 0.1%, 0.1%, 0.1%, 0.1%, 0.1%, 0.1%, 0.1%
acetophil cleanser, clobetazole, um, it's and minoxidil, and I use that all the time. Okay, and how do I inject ligand planocalaris? Again, it's, I inject uh, 10 milligrams per cc, and I go into where they have hair, and I go around the spot. This shows you the depth that I'm using to kind of have some idea. How do I um, inject frontal fibrosing alopecia? It's 2.5 milligrams per cc, because it's near the face. I'll do 30 injections, three cc's, and go from one ear to the other, and I'll go one centimeter behind the hairline for frontal fibrosing. So this, this again is just a summary of what we've just discussed. This is how I treat uh, lichen planopalaris. Now, what else can I use? Um, Actos or pioglitazone is something that is a uh, PPAR gamma agonist. We feel that in L lichen planopalaris there's too little uh, PPAR gamma and you want to kind of activate it, so I will use uh, Actos 15 to 30 milligrams a day, and that's something else you can add to your regimen. Another thing that's new that I started using is naltrexone. It's an anti-opioid at low dose. Now, heroin addicts get naltrexone, but usually 50 milligrams plus a day. But at low dose, it is an anti-inflammatory, and we published this. At, we use it at 3 milligrams to 4.5 milligrams a day, and so it's been shown to be used in other autoimmune conditions as well. So you may want to consider using naltrexone. You can get your pharmacist to crush the tablets and put it in capsules of three to 4.5 milligrams each. So the oral treatments are hydroxychloroquine, doxycycline, mycophenol mofetil, pioglitazone, and naltrexone. What about frontal fibrosing alopecia, which um, awesome already discussed. Um, this is something we're seeing more and more of. I'm seeing a lot of frontal fibrosing alopecia, at least two or three a day. Um, it's most commonly in postmenopausal women, but 20% of cases occur in younger individuals as well. And in, we're seeing a few more cases in men, uh, but not as many as we see as in women. This is the classic cases. I think we're all familiar with frontal fibrosing alopecia now. The eyebrows can be affected first. We published our first 62 cases. Um, these was, this was from Vancouver when I worked at the University of British Columbia. And more recently, and you'll be getting a copy of this, 92 cases from NYU. And, and we'll, we should go through all the treatments that we used. But this was interesting. We did an epidemiology on the alopecia types in my office, and you'll see that frontal fibrosing alopecia now consists of 23% of, um, of my patients that I see. I would like to plan a polaris alone is 10%. Now, uh, this is just the demographics. Um, in terms of 92 patients, two were men, 90 were women. Some 14% had symptoms. 11% had some other autoimmune disease, and 96% had eyebrow involvement. The most important thing about this table is to show that we were able to stabilize disease in 70%. So in 70%, we were able to stop this condition from progressing, and, um, and it usually took around 10 months for us to stabilize it. So, and these are from the, um, Vancouver paper, just to give you an idea, the youngest case I've ever seen was age 18. So we do see it sometimes in young people, and most people were, um, uh, most, pe most people, however, were much older. If you want, I can go over a few more slides. Yes, please. To, okay, I'll just quickly go over uh, a few more slides on um, this. Uh, these were other signs that they had, itching, burning, pain, that kind of thing. Um, I'll go to the next, next slide, please. It's not. Okay, the lonely hairs. Uh, these are the views that we take when we see an FFA patient. We photograph meticulously with the photo finder. We'll also measure the labella to the hairline. We'll also take right and left outer canthite to hairline, and we'll do sides to the hairline as well. We use a, a flexible ruler, and what we'll do is we'll bell to hairline, 
then write out our path list to Hairline and take these measurements every time they come in, and then the sideburns as well. And we use either Photoscope or, um, uh, or the Photo Finder to look at the activity of the condition. If we see it's very active, we'll be very aggressive. These are the kinds of treatments we used. Again, in relief, uh, TCM is something we use all the time. The only thing that I add here is finasteride or dutasteride when it comes to uh, LPP. Now, what about what causes it? There were some papers talking about sunscreens being higher, being used more than in controls. This is in men and women from England. Uh, and I think that this is something that we have to look at. We published something in the British Journal of Dermatology, and we found that the initiation of oxybenzone and apobenzone were started in 1988. These are UVA blockers. And we feel that they may have something to do with it. Um, so I usually tell patients to use zinc oxide or titanium dioxide on their face and sunscreen and to avoid oxy or avobenzone. And, and transplants are possible if the condition has not been active for a long time. Here's a frontal fibrosis that we did a transplant. Okay. I'm going to do a few more minutes if you want to. Okay. Continue more. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'll just quickly go through folliculitis and calvans. Uh, it won't take long. Um, okay, this is what folliculitis and calvans looks like. I just wanted to go through the algorithm really. Okay, it's keflexin, 500 milligrams to ID or doxycycline, 100 milligrams VID, plus the injections, plus mucuricin cream. If there is improvement, rate, we taper and use the mucuricin cream. If there is no improvement, consider rifampin, uh, 300 milligrams VID, clindamycin, 300 milligrams VID, or ciprofloxacin, 500 milligrams VID with mucuricin cream. If there's improvement, taper to the lowest dose. No improvement, you may want to do a repeat course. Uh, if the remission is not sustained. We may also want to consider fusidic acid, 500 milligrams TID, and Z, 15 milligrams. So finally, uh, dissecting cellulitis, how do I treat that? I usually use Accutane plus injections. We do that for four months. If there is no improvement, consider Keflexin, QID, doxycycline, 100 milligrams VID, plus incisional drainage. If it does work, we'll continue it. Just to show you the incisional drainage, we may uh, lance it or we'll take the liquid out because it's so painful. So the take home message is this is a, um, a trichologic emergency. You have to, I tell every patient that every hair they lose from this, it's like a cemetery, it's like a funeral, it's over. So we have to be aggressive when we treat these patients. So I hope you now have a fresher view of how to treat these. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jenny, for the lovely presentation. And it's my pleasure now to introduce our dear friend of Charles Durban, Dr. Fernanda Touré from uh, Brazil. Dr. Fernanda is a pioneer in pathology and health diseases, and she will present the Moscow of scarring alopecia. So our learning objectives for today is to answer three questions. One, how trichoscopy of the normal scalp looks like? And then two, how to recognize a scaring alopecia with trichoscopy? And three, how is the trichoscopic findings of the many cicatricial alopecia that Jerry just uh, told us? So first, how trichoscopy of the normal scalp looks like. 
So first, let's take a look on the non-pigmented scalp. This is a normal trichoscopy. We see the follicular units, they are regularly distributed. They contain one to three to four terminal hair shells and some thin hairs. So, so this is normal. With higher magnification, we might see the simple loops that correspond to the normal vascular pattern. Okay. And some arborized vessels, which are also normal to see in the non pigmented scalp. For the pigmented scalp, we have a different pattern. We have the same distribution for the follicular units. The distance is a little uh, larger than in the non pigmented and we see the honeycomb pigmented network in the background. And we see these very small pinpoint white dots, and they correspond to the opening of the acrine sweet blades. So this is very important for us today because the white dots, they are present in the normal scalp, in non-cicatricial alopecia, and they are present in cicatricial alopecia that spares the glands. So this uh, makes that, for example, LPP and alopecia areata, in some cases they are very similar, so we have to be careful with the pigmented scalp. It's very important that we do trichoscopy first without liquid interface to see the scaling patterns, and then with the liquid interface to see the skin and the vascular patterns. So now let's see how to recognize a scale of alopecia with trichoscopy. So if we remind with what we just see from the normal trichoscopy, we see here a different scenario. We see uh, absent follicular units. We cannot see the follicular openings. We see some terminal sparse hairs. And if it's inflamed, we can see also some perifollicular erythema in this formation, and you see loss of the follicular units and the follicular openings. And it's also a sign for scaring alopecia, a pilitorted hair. Okay, but we have to take care because if the hair of the patient is curly, it cannot be diagnosed as pilitorted because of the curly hair. But in a context of um, uh, and a scary process, this is a sign for active disease, okay, the pilitor. And in some pigmented uh, areas, we might see some whitish areas that correspond to fibrosis, like here, and we might see some discomation and some tufting, which are many hairs coming from the same ostium. And in some scary alopecia, folliculitis and calcums, we might have many uh, 20 hairs coming from the same ostium. So this is very suggestive of scaling process. Another thing that is a uh, use, uh, useful tip, we might see some sub-epidermal or ingrowing hairs. This is a tip for scaring alopecia. Now that we just saw how to recognize, let's see the main trichoscopic features of uh, these common conditions. The four one that Jerry described and central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia. So first, discoid lupus. So this is a very typical trichoscopy and what we see is the whitish structureless areas. We see follicular plugging here and we see abnormal thick dilated vessels. So this is very typical for lupus erythematosus. What's also very typical is this scattered speckle hyperpigmentation, like the salt and pepper that we see in melanocytic lesions. So this is very suggestive for lupus erythematosus. Another, uh, another case with whitish areas, some speckles, hyperpigmentation and some erythema. And this is a very useful sign for active uh, lupus erythematosus, which are the red dots. The red dots are a sign of early disease, so we might treat this patient very aggressive because this, in these cases the, the hair may regrow when we see red dots. So it's a very important trichoscopic sign. 
now, like in Plano Pilares and in front of fibrosis in alopecia. So, what's very typical for trichoscopy of LPP is the concentric perifollicular discomation that we see here, okay? And the areas with absent hairs, dystrophic hair. And this is also very typical, it's a target hyperpigmentation. So LPP just affects the hair follicles, not all the, um, the annexoid structures like lupus. So here we have a target hyperpigmentation. And in lupus, if you just remind, we have the speckle hyperpigmentation. So this is very typical for LPP. What's also very typical is the hair casts, which are these tubular structures that surround the hair shafts, and this is a sign for very active disease. Okay? And you see in the background the pigmented network, you see the small pinpoint white dots, they are present in LPP because LPP doesn't affect the glands. Okay? And here a hair, hair cast in a close detail with the concentric perifollicular discommission. And here, with some distortion in the honeycomb pigmented network, giving a tip for cicatricial alopecia and the concentric hyperperifollicular scale. In some cases, depending on the degree of the inflammation, you see an erythema in the background, and you see very very diffuse and aggressive scaling here. And in some cases, it's rare to see in the skull, but we can see the structures uh, that correspond to the hick weakhamstria that we see in LPP and lichen planus of the skin. But it's rare to see in the skull. In front of fibrosis, which is a variant from LPP, we might have different degrees of inflammation, and then we have different degrees of inflammation also in trichoscopy. You see here a lot of the perifollicular discomation, here the whitish areas, some dystrophic hair, and some cases they have very mild inflammation, so we, we don't see uh, really the inflammation, like here. You just see the whitish area, the absent vellus hair, which are very typical for this condition, and uh, few discommation. So in the normal frontal hairline, it's common that we have a lot of vellus thin hair. So the absence of the vellus hair is a tip for early diagnosis of frontal fibrosis alopecia, because it first affects the vellus hair. So we see just terminal hairs. And it's also useful to use trichoscopy to evaluate the eyebrows, which are typically, they have the tattoo, and we see a lot of weird dystrophic hairs. And sometimes the patients describe that they look like pubic hairs in the eyebrows. So it's also useful to use dermoscopy here. Now, two of the neutrophilics, dissecting cellularis. I just included one case for early diagnosis because sometimes it starts with the small nodule. And what we have in trichoscopy, and sometimes it might simulate even alopecia areata, so we have to be careful. You see a lot of black dots, and you see um, some, some yellow dots, empty follicles, and some whitish area. And here, what is very typical, it's called the soap bubble structures, which are these yellow dots with the black dots inside, looking like a soap bubble. So this is an early sign for dissecting cellulitis and very early lesions. And what is important is that the scaling process is, if we take it in the beginning and we treat them hard, they might regrow completely. So it's very important that we can recognize early, do early diagnosis. And you see here in trichoscopy, the hairs are regrowing. Folliculitis the carbons. So what is very typical in trichoscopy is the tufty folliculitis with more than six hairs. And we also have this tubular but crusted 
yellowish cast, which is also very typical because of the yellow crests. And we have this cold starburst pattern surrounding the tufting hairs, like this. And we see clinically the postal formation. Rudnika described these three stages. This one is very typical, which is the postal with some blood inside. So it's typical of Folliculitis de Cadmus. And the last one, which is CCCA, it's very common in Brazil. And it's the most common scary alopecia in black patients. So it's very important. It's the most common one. So in Brazil, half of the population are black. So it's very important for us. There is very common. And what we have, depending on the degree of inflammation, we might have loss of the follicular units with this whitish area, some erythema, and we have loss of white dots if it's really inflamed. If it's not so inflamed with the network, the pigmented network in the background, we'll keep the white dots, okay? Some pilitoity, but we have to take care because they, most of them are black patients, so the hair is normally curly. And what is very typical is the white gray halo. So this is a triposcopic sign. If we see like this, we might do the, big, the biopsy here, and we see the premature degeneration, which is typical for this disease. So it's very useful if we use triposcopy to choose the biopsy site when evaluating hair disorders. So we want to take the biopsy from here, where there is inflammation, and, and we'll see the characteristics for the right diagnosis. And this is uh, how I do in the office. I take the clinical pictures and the triposcope pictures with photo finder. And Doya, she's my dermatopathologist. I send her and she does the biopsy and do the histopathology. So it's the triposcope WhatsApp guided biopsy. And when it works really well. It's very good if the pathologist can see the clinical image and even the triposcopic image is very useful for them. And it's also very useful for follow-up. You see here on the left before, and here on the right with low inflammation. And if you have an MI or anything like that, you can compare at the same region. So it's also very useful for follow-up. So it's just important for us to remind that every scaling alopecia starts with a small area or a small patch. So it's very important for us to recognize early these disorders and I hope that recoscopy can help you to, to do that. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is um, uh, Professor Asif Farhan. He's supposed to uh, give us some uh, clinical cases. Um, if he's not here yet, to take some questions. Does anybody have any questions for me or Veranda? Please ask. Oh, voting. Please vote. Sorry. Okay, well, we'll take any questions. We're here for questions. Okay. Is there a microphone for the people in the audience? So everyone can hear your questions, too. Mike, please. Is there a microphone? Just want to ask uh, a single question. Uh, when we 
we can safely use uh, pension plant in those cicatrician alopecias? Um, is there a specific sign where we can uh, search for it uh, as uh, that, that tells us that this uh, reaction is uh, stable and we can treat it with uh, hair transplant? Thanks. Hair transplant. Oh, hair transplant. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, my, I used to do hair transplants, quite a few of them. I waited uh, for at least two years without treatment to make sure they were not active. Then if they were not active, it would then, um, we would then do a test area of around 50 to 100 grafts, and if they were okay and they survived, then we would do more. So I would say off treatment, wait two years, then um, do a test area. We'll always do risk that it's gonna come back. And patients need to be warned. Uh, what I think is that you should treat at least two years to observe how the patient goes. And then, like Jerry, no years, uh, two years with no treatment before considering it. Especially in the IPB and frontal fibrosis because the risk of cavity phenomenon that might occur, so they might worse after the procedure. There are many cases of frontal fibrosis appearing after facial lifting and many cases of LPP after hair transplantation and because of kidney phenomenon. So we have to be very careful. At least two years of treatment to, um, and anyway we cannot guarantee it will not um, that so it's a risk. To Professor Jerry Shapiro about endocrinicolitis carcinosis. Uh, one of the professors, actually, Professor Ross, mentioned that he picked off the lesion because the antibiotics are not going to work. And you, you mentioned doxycycline, you mentioned methamoxine, you mentioned uh, alacin, and so on. And so, what I am going to do, because he started early to work. In, the, in a surgical way to take it off. Okay, so your question is why use antibiotics in these two He wants to, he, he is using surgery to take it off, the lesion, because uh, the, the antibiotic doesn't work. Okay, you have to be careful with surgery, because once you start surgery, you may make the condition worse. The patient needs to be warned that if they cut things out, they start cutting out a localized area for the cholestic elements, or a localized area, dissecting cellulite, or whatever. If you cut something out, you may make it worse, especially lupus, okay? And I think like in conovalirus as well. So you have to be really careful when you're cutting them out, because you may make it worse. No, in, in the bacteria, in the peripolyculitis, so that's a 